Falter of Galer, good you all done Shelburne, eh, and you've done Ocod Specialta, Starulsha. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome you all here today to the Shelburne um, to mark 100 years since the passing of the Irish Free State 1922 Constitution. And I'm really looking forward to hearing all of the fantastic speakers uh, that we've lined up today. Um, for myself and Donal, it's just been wonderful to see the interest that there has been um, in this event. Uh, when we were discussing the idea of having a conference uh, last year, uh, we kind of weren't sure you know, how many people would be interested in, in speaking and in attending, um, but we were absolutely blown away by the response to the call for papers earlier on this year, um, and also in the interest that there has been in the event itself. And it's really heartening to see so much interest in what I think has been quite a neglected area in our legal history. Um, I remember in my undergraduate career being quite surprised that there was so little reference to the 1922 Constitution uh, studying law, particularly when like, so much of it has made its way into our, our current document. Um, and it was something that had piqued my interest in, in studying Leaving Cert history. So when it came to choosing a PhD topic, I went along to Brian Farrell's fantastic series of articles from the 1970s, um, and Aikinson and Fallon had a similar set of articles as well. And once I had read those, I knew that there was something really important here. Um, as lawyers, we had somehow neglected it, um, but this was a document that deserved attention. And not just on the controversial elements that are often associated with it, um, and that was the reason that I decided to, to focus on it for my PhD study. I needed to know more about what is such a fascinating document. Um, I'll never forget on one occasion I was asked what I was doing for my PhD by a lawyer. And when I explained that I was looking at the 1922 constitution, they said, but that wasn't really a constitution. Um, and I was somewhat shocked. And very often when I would talk about the 22 constitution, the only things that ever came up were the Oath of Allegiance, the King, the Civil War. Um, and so personally, in my own work, I tried to go beyond that and look at the substance of the document itself. And I was so impressed by the committee in particular that drafted this document. And um, they were so ambitious and so creative um, in seeking solutions. And they were willing to innovate when it would have been so much easier just to imitate. And things might not have worked out how they would have hoped, of course, but it is still important that we interrogate and that we appreciate uh, the document for what it was. And it's lovely today, actually, that we have some personal and familial connections as well. Uh, we have Lord Stevens on video later on, whose grandfather was a secretary to the committee. Um, we have Mr. Justice Morris Collins and Ms. Justice Isolt O'Malley, who also have family connections. So it's really exciting to see also all of this new research and new interest um, in this area. And I hope that with the event today and with the collection that we hope to produce afterwards, that we can continue to shed light on the Constitution, on its legacy and on its impact on our law more generally. Now, we have a really busy program ahead of us today, so I'm not going to take up uh, much more of your time, but I do just want to say a very quick thank you, and Donal is going to be thanking others at the very end, but I have to very quickly thank Donal himself uh, for agreeing to co-organise the conference with me and for being a brilliant co-organiser. Um, I often think organising conferences is a little bit like having babies. Afterwards, you think, I'm never going to do that again. Um, and then after a while, you say, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll do it again, and then it's only when you get into it you remember how much was actually involved which is why I'm so grateful to Donal uh, because just a few months ago he organized a major international conference and was still willing to put up with all of my annoying emails and <laughs> there's not many who would uh, so Mila Buik is Donal and now it's time to introduce our very first speaker today so we're very honored to have him to open the conference for us as someone who has degrees in both law and history and economics, and as someone who deals with the Constitution on a daily basis uh, as part of his role, and previously in practice, and also as a historian, having written on issues such as the life and career of Daniel O'Connell, for example, I think he's ideally placed to talk to us today about the 1922 Constitution and its vision. Of course, he's also a Kerry man, which is even more important. Um, so, Le Verdol Kurgi Fault, I on Tard Agnet, Mr. Paul Gallagher Essie.
thank you very much, Laura. I, I would like to thank Laura and Donal for organising the, this wonderful event. And I am very appreciative of the privilege of being asked to speak at the event. You'll excuse me if I have to depart immediately after my paper. Um, I want to consider the Constitution from the viewpoint of the legal legacy it created and its importance in setting this country on a path that would embed the rule of law and would ultimately enable Ireland to become one of the leading and most stable democracies in the world with a broad vision of equality, social coherence, social responsibility, commitment to its people and to Europe. At first sight, it might appear that this has little to do with the 1922 Constitution. However, I believe closer reflection on the circumstances of the Constitution and of the ideology and institutions which it embraced will lead to a more positive conclusion as to its importance in the history of uh, this independent state. Thomas Jefferson, in 1802, said that written constitutions would be violated in moments of passion or delusion, yet they furnish a text to which those who are watchful may again rally and recall the people. I believe the Free State Constitution, despite its undermining by Amendment Number 16 and by judicial interpretation, set a framework for constitutional government which was expanded upon and reinforced in 1937. In 2021, the political philosopher Jonathan Rauch, in The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth, described a constitution with reference to the US Constitution as a mechanism for forging compromise. He considered the separation of powers, the requirement to create majorities in Parliament, all contributed to compromise, which he believed was important in terms of social cohesion and maintaining liberal democracy. The Free State Constitution provided the framework for compromise and facilitated the peaceful transfer of power in 1932. It offered a different theory of republicanism um, than that offered by many of sorry, excuse me, than that offered by many at the time. The theory of republicanism was based on the classical theory of government and not on what Tom Garvin described as the secular religion of republicanism based on the idea of a moral community created by a single and irreversible plebiscite and satisfied by the blood of martyrs. Some form of constitution was required in 1922 to address the functional requirements of the new state. A legal basis for the government and its institutions was clearly required. The constitution which was adopted was, in terms of its con content, much more than a functional constitution. In Article 6 to 10, it recognised important fundamental rights, including the liberty of the person, free expression of opinion, the right to free elementary education, it enshrined entitlement to vote on all citizens without differentiation of sex, and it recognised the independence of the judiciary and the right of everybody to be tried in due course of law. Those provisions, protective of the people's rights, are consistent with the fundamental principle of sovereignty deriving from the people enshrined in Article 2 of the Constitution. On its face, this was a modern constitution for its time, which deliberately rejected the notion of parliamentary sovereignty. It reflected a broader European heritage and favoured the American tradition of judicial review. Its focus on the sovereignty of the people legitimised the foundation of the state and gave it an internal authority. Hugh Kennedy recognised this in early 1922. He noted privately that there were two forms of states one in which all legislative, executive and judicial authority derived from the people who composed the state and who gave the state its legal existence. In the other, the legislative, executive and judicial authority is, derived, is not derived solely from the people who compose it, but such powers are derived from another power external to them. In this latter form, 
the people who compose the state do not give the state its legal existence. He reasoned that a treaty can only be signed between two sovereign states and argued that its very title demonstrated Irish sovereign statehood and thus, of course, confirmed its origin, uh, the origin of the constitution and the people. It is true that the potential of these rights, of these fundamental rights, was never realised and that the constitution suffered from some fatal flaws exacerbated by the extension of the period of legislative amendment and more particularly inadequate drafting reflected in Article 50 in this context. Kennedy, in the foreword to Cohen's book, said the use of Article 50 for effecting legislative amendment deprived the Constitution of its far-reaching character and the protections that were contained in it, and that this was far from the ideals and minds of the authors of the Constitution. The Constitution also suffered from the judicial recognition of the doctrine of implied amendment in Cooney and Clinton and Attorney General and McBride. Notwithstanding the fact that the government enacted all post-Cooney amendments, apart from the Public Safety Act 1927, as express amendments of the Constitution, these decisions, which in my view were wrongly decided, provided a legal basis for completely undermining constitution protect, constitutional protections. Having regard to the wording of Article 50, there are strong grounds for arguing that this interpretation is itself unconstitutional. First, the very concept of amendment being made by the Oireachtas implies that the Oireachtas should identify the amendments it is making. After all, the very provision of a formal amendment mechanism implies that the amendments will be identified. Furthermore, the requirement after the expiration of eight years that the amendment be passed by the two houses before it is even submitted to a referendum of the people suggests that the nature of the amendment must be clearly identified in order to enable the people to express their consent. It is difficult to understand how the people could ever have been asked to express their consent on an implied amendment. It is also difficult to understand how the entitlement of the Oireachtas to amend the eight-year period and to amend within the eight-year period could therefore have been interpreted to permit implicit rather than explicit amendments. The power of legislative amendment was provided, as again Hugh Kennedy acknowledged in the foreword to Cohen's book, to correct errors and drafting, uh, to correct typographical and drafting errors and was an exception only to that extent. To construe it as conferring the additional significant power of implicit amendment had no basis in the text. Furthermore, the idea of implicit amendment is difficult to accommodate in the context of an interpretation of the Constitution as a whole and of the ideals and rights that it sought to protect. With regard to the latter, it was clear that Article 50 was creating an exception to the principle of amendment by referendum and accordingly should have been strictly interpreted. In this context, the interpretation of Article 50 in the state Ryan and Lennon as permitting the extension of the original eight-year period of legislative amendment seems patently inconsistent with the popular sovereignty enshrined in Article 2 and the stated purpose of Article 50 and its wording. Furthermore, the interpretation deprived the Constitution indefinitely of the protection by referendum. It, in an important sense, therefore, the Constitution was undermined not only by the government, but by the interpretation of judges who ought to have defended it. In this context, the legitimacy of much of the judicial interpretation can be seriously questioned. However, this undermining must also be seen in the context of the time and the fact that those who advocated it were brought up in a different legal uh, tradition. Again, Hugh Kennedy in the foreword to Cohen said that it was accepted without criticism at the time, both in law and in, the, and in philosophy, that the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty was supreme. 
and he said the tendencies of those so educated emerged during the period of interpretation of the Constitution. The judiciary were not experienced in constitutional interpretation and, as I say, were brought up in that tradition. Furthermore, as Mr Justice Hogan observed in the origins of the Irish Constitution, had the decision in Ryan been otherwise, every amendment after December 1930 would have had to have been by way of referendum, and one can only conjecture how the electorate would have responded to referenda on such topics as Article 2A and the abolition of the oath, the, the abolition of the appeal to the Privy Council, the Senate, the Governor-General, and all references to the Crown in the Constitution. The requirement of amendment by referendum, conditional on a majority of voters on the register or two-thirds of the votes registered, were stringent and would have made these amendments, which effected important changes in Ireland's relationship to the UK, very difficult to achieve. In this regard, it is important to reflect on the unusual circumstances in which this constitution came into being. The crisis of 1922-23 made Ireland's leaders fearful of public consultation. The state was very weak and inexperienced and rejected by many. Ireland had just recently been involved in a major struggle for its independence. It never had the indigenous institutions through which Irish politicians could be significantly involved in the political process. In fact, Irish politicians had been excluded from political power. Accordingly, it did not have the institutional or intellectual environment conducive to the development of a constitutional framework. The new leaders were, by and large, the veterans of guerrilla warfare, and their political legitimacy was in dispute. While the law offered a defence against the ideological arguments of the anti-treatyites, there was a relative absence of lawyers in the pre-treaty elite. However, lawyers became fundamental to the establishment of the electoral democracy. James Madison and his contemporaries knew that America's republic could not be legitimate if it was not democratic. But they also understood that democracy was an inherently unstable form of government. In the turmoil of the aftermath of the War of Independence and the beginning of the Civil War, there was limited intellectual and legal resources that were available. The Constitution in that context was a remarkable achievement. Its provisions ensured not only the institutions but the principles of democracy and set the new state on a democratic trajectory from which it has never deviated. The Constitution held out the prospect of a new political and legal reality and offered an exciting transformation in the legal and institutional structures which had previously prevailed. The essential enablers and connectors in society are institutions. Institutions propagate and reinforce norms and rules evaluate and certify credentials, set agendas, direct resources, enforce accounts accountability, and train future generations to do all these things. The Constitution provided for those institutions and legitimised the government. Indeed, it did so with so much success that de Valera, post-1927, accepted the political framework which it, it had created. It was that political framework that protected democracy in this country at a time when it came under serious threat elsewhere and was so devastatingly undermined in many countries. The Constitution has been, been criticised for not reflecting the radical and socialist thought and for, per for perpetuating a conservative society that did not realise the full potential or possibilities that were realised in other countries following the First World War. However, it must be observed that many of the radical socialist post-war constitutions did not flourish, and many did not last. The 15 years of the Constitution created, notwithstanding its flaws, a democratic and legal structure which, on the basis of the which formed the basis of the 1937 Constitution. 
1937 Constitution explicitly made Ireland a republic, and it did so on the basis of building on the norms and institutions created by the 1922 Constitution. By the standards of its time, the 1922 Constitution was an impressive document, although as Ireland became uh, more uh, educated and uh, more developed, it soon became apparent that it could not withstand the passage of time and had to be replaced. The 1937 Constitution was a much more significant document, a sophisticated document and carried within it the potential to develop, a potential to develop facilitated by a mechanism for referendum by popular voting, which allowed it to develop and embrace the changing attitudes of societies, albeit not as fast as some people wished. It was also interpreted as a living document, which gave it a flexibility which the 1922 Constitution did not have. John Morris Kelly said that the constitutional jurisprudence with reference to the 1937 Constitution had produced results which were beneficial, rational, progressive and fair. Judicial interpretation denied this critical reinforcement to the 1922 Constitution and undermined its status and value. However, the Constitution nevertheless played an important role in defending the state. Chief Justice O'Higgins in 1976 said, it is true that the Constitution is a legal document, but it is a fundamental one and which establishes the state and it expresses not only the legal norms, but the basic doctrines of political and social theory. That is precisely what the 1922 Constitution did at a time of immense challenge and difficulty for the country. It did so at a time when the provisional government was trying to deal with ex existential problems to address the major issues caused by the position of the United Kingdom and was fighting a civil war in what Tom Garvin calls, the, on what Tom Garvin calls the linked issues of majoritarianism and membership of the British Commonwealth or Empire against an incoherently held view of an isolated pure and virtuous republic. In 1922, Michael Collins said, a new page of Irish history is beginning. We have a rich and fertile country, a strong and intelligent people. With peace, security and union, no one can foresee the limits of greatness and well-being to which our country can aspire. Viewed from 2022, those words were prophetic, though it was a long time before the aspirations so expressed came to be realised. I sometimes think, however, that many of the criticisms of the 1922 Constitution and of the type of Ireland reflected in it failed to properly take account of the enormous challenges which the new state is dealing with and the lack of resources intellectual and economic available to the state and the very different and historical social, uh, the very difficult, different historical and social context of the time. In 1922, in the birth of Irish democracy, Tom Garvin refers to the extremely influential set of papers by Seymour Martin Lipset in the 1960s, which argued that stable representative democracy was closely associated with high living standards and was difficult to establish in poor countries. Garvin says that later writers had qualified the picture, but it remained clear that poor countries have great difficulty in maintaining democracy, fundamentally because any wealth in the society is in the hands of a tiny and powerful minority, and they resist sharing it and also resist any change in the property system that might endanger their political position. Tom Garvin also said that for a generation after independence, Ireland's standard of living contrasted with those of the geographical and cultural nearest neighbours, Britain and the United States. Not only was Ireland relatively poor, but the Irish had in front of their eyes the demoralising demonstration in Britain and America that of a higher level of economic achievement and success and confidence. 
This connection between economic development and democracy has been more recently recognised by Francis Fukuyama in The End of History and The Last Man, though he acknowledges that a successful economic development on its own by no means guarantees the existence of a liberal democracy. It is true that the Irish people prior to 1922 had a century of experience not with democratic government nor with democratic elections, sorry, had a century of experience not with democratic government but with democratic elections and had the example of a work, working democracy in the US and the United Kingdom. Nevertheless, the significance of the adoption of a constitution that enshrined this democracy should not be downplayed. The Irish achievement of stable democracy in the turmoil of the time was by any standards a great achievement. The constitution, because of its flaws, did not develop as it might have done as a, and as a consequence had a limited lifespan. However, during its lifespan, it provided the legal underpinning for the institutions and the laws and facilitated the peaceful handover of power in 1932 and ensured the commitment of both sides to, in the civil war to constitutional democracy. There is no doubt that the experience of the constitution and the identica identification of its flaws provided the drafters of the 1937 constitution with a template and guidance that would not otherwise have been available. In an important sense, it made the Irish people accustomed to a constitutional structure. It identified the issues, uh, sorry, it, it, in an important sense, it made Irish people accustomed to a constitutional structure and it identified the issues which needed correcting in the later constitution. Without a constitutional structure in 1922, there is no guarantee that Ireland would have adopted a constitution in 1937 or indeed at any later time. This is particularly so given that by 1937, in many countries, constitutions were being ignored or undermined. As somebody with experience of the challenge of, challenges of government in difficult times and the challenge of drafting legislative solutions within very short time frames, I have enormous respect for what was achieved by the drafters of the Constitution. The Constitution Committee was established by the Provisional Government on 17 January 1922 to prepare the draft Constitution. The political sensitivity of the Committee's work was such that the Provisional Government determined that it was to be kept confidential. The Committee considered that the Irish obligation was to ensure the Constitution did not breach the Treaty. Kennedy himself referred to the severe limitations of the time afforded to them. They were given a month for their work, which was later extended because of the sickness of committee members and the frequent absence of Kennedy and other business. The initial drafting was done within a mere six weeks. Three drafts were produced. They were considered by the provisional government, which opted for draft B, with some adjustments thereafter. By 25 May 1922, a draft constitution was finally approved by the provisional government, but it was deliberately not made public to avoid problems with the anti-treatyites. These circumstances must be contrasted with the circumstances in which the American constitution and the 1937 constitution were drafted. The speed with which the Free State constitution was drafted, the lack of resources available to the drafters, the pressures of the time, the distractions of the British dimension, and the requirement to have a constitution capable of dealing with the chaos, disorder and division which Ireland was experiencing made things very difficult. The scale of the achievement, achievement can be measured by the fact that the Constitutional Review Group in 1995 had a year to make suggestions for constitutional change, just to make suggestions and not to redraft the Constitution. And they were provided with substantial resources to achieve that limited task. In that context, it is not surprising that there were flaws in the Constitution and that provision was made for legislative amendment to address matters which had been overlooked or incorrectly addressed. Apart from the difficulties in public consultation in unsettled times, it is not perhaps surprising 
that given the challenges of the time, the fraught relationship with Britain and the desire to sever the British links, that the government considered that legislative amendment was necessary to achieve its objectives. Establishing and maintaining public order was understandably a high priority of the government. Neither is it surprising that judges familiar with the idea of parliamentary sovereignty and with no experience in constitutional interpretation interpreted the constitution in a manner which magnified its flaws and ultimately undermined it as a constitutional framework. The twin assault from the government and the courts undoubtedly damaged the constitution and, as I have said, provided a lesson on what needed to be addressed in any future constitution. Accordingly, the 1922 constitution is better seen as part of a constitutional tradition which developed and became more sophisticated and effective over time. The constitutional tradition provided a firm basis for a flourishing liberal democracy that is now the envy of many countries. In the end of history, Francis Fukuyama, in 1989, in an article for National Interest, argued that a remarkable consensus concerning the legitimacy of liber liberal democracy as a system of government throughout the world had emerged, and this was the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the final form of human government. We now know Fukuyama's optimism with regard to the acceptance of liberal democracy was, was misplaced. But we can be proud that in 1922, in the turmoil of the time, we embraced liberal democracy and it has become our final, final form of government and must be maintained as such. Today, liberal democracy is under threat in many countries in a way which it was impossible to imagine until very recently. While we can take nothing for granted in this country, the fact that our liberal democracy was born in a period of great division and was nurtured in a time of significant poverty and backwardness and unfulfilled ambition and economic and social challenge provides us with a firmer foundation than in many countries. That liberal democracy has survived in this country for 100 years is a great achievement of which we can be proud. I have no doubt that its survival was in large part due to the constitutional framework in which the state was founded. The values enshrined in the constitution, the recognition of popular sovereignty, the protection of fundamental rights, and the establishment of sound constitutions were the great achievement of that constitution. Sometimes when looking at its deficiencies or in debating the extent of the rights which it protected and focusing on its flaws, we miss this essential achievement. Despite everything, the legitimacy of the state which it engendered and created was accepted within five years by both sides in the civil war as a framework, however imperfect, as the framework for continued government and for the continued existence of the state. Absent the 1922 constitution, or indeed if we had been provided with a constitution that was less developed, more restrictive, and failed to recognise important rights, our history could have been very different. For me, this is the achievement of the 1922 constitution. There isn't a direct causal link between then and now, but there rarely is in the historical and political sphere. The heroic acceptance in 1922 of the need for a solid legal order and the recognition of rights and values brought a stability which was the sine qua non of the state's ultimate development. We owe these people a great debt, debt and can only admire the vision, courage and optimism which they displayed. Today's generation are the real beneficiaries of the generation of Irish people who built the state, resolved their differences and who did so in a constitutional framework. This is the generation that lives with the benefit of the European legal order, which provides the greatest embodiment of the rule of law in the history of mankind. Founded as it is on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, respect for human rights, it reflects the lessons and knowledge gained from the tumult and destruction and death of the Second World War. The Free State Constitution was in truth 
a powerful affirmation of the sovereignty of the people and the urgent need to provide the stable government and protect the rights of the people. It is not surprising, given the circumstances in which it evolved, that it did not stand the test of time and contained serious deficiencies. Nevertheless, it is a source of immense pride that the Irish state and the Irish people, despite the history of oppression and denial, despite all the difficulties, all the fighting, all the dissension, all the inexperience, was born in a constitutional framework which reflected in 1922 uh, values that are now part of that great European, uh, European legal order. Thank you very much indeed. That is a, a wonderful um, opening uh, paper, which I think will set the, the scene for much of what we will discuss later in the day. And I know the Attorney General is shortly to leave government service when the great coalition switcheroo happens on uh, Saturday week. And best of luck with your return to private practice. My name is David McCullough. I'm chairing the first uh, session, which is titled Reflections on Individual Aspects, which I think is Laura and Donald's polite way of saying that there's no overarching theme uh, to the three papers, unlike in some of the later sessions, except in this sense that each of our speakers are going to look at a very important issue which was addressed in the 1922 Constitution and is still very relevant today, where to draw the line between property rights and the common good, the question of whether constitutional references to the Irish language are effective or are mere window dressing, and the vital question of the state's role in protecting the environment. And we have three excellent speakers to address those issues. Dr. Rachel Walsh is an associate professor at the School of Law at Trinity College in Dublin and is an expert in the areas of constitutional law and theory and property law and theory. Beside her, Dr. Roisin Costello is a qualified barrister and an assistant professor of law at DCU School of Law and Government. Her work focuses on EU law, media law, privacy and data protection law, language rights and the impact of the law on women's rights. And Jamie McLaughlin is a PhD candidate at UCD's Sutherland School of Law and his areas of research interest include Irish and comparative constitutional law, international and comparative human rights law with a particular focus on the constitutionalization there's a good word, of social, economic, and environmental human rights. Now, we're going to hear from our three speakers. There is a time limit, and I'm very strict, uh, of uh, about 12 minutes. And then there'll be time for questions afterwards. So I'd ask you to keep those questions in mind until we've heard all three uh, of the papers. And, we'll then... and Roisin's paper is called Symbolism and Substance, Irish Language Rights in the 1922 Constitution. Roisin. Thank you very much, David. Um, good morning, everybody, and Movikas Morla Nikoglaki, us on on Kura Lerkliv August Kashton Gelga Kura Nor Avenue. Um, it's, I suppose, an often neglected aspect of the Constitution's uh, framing in 1922 and perhaps subsequently, um, and, and an important one, I think, in terms of uh, grappling with the limits of justiciability under the Constitution, uh, and certainly um, the way in which we marry, I suppose, the symbolic elements of our constitutional identity with the more substantive and practical ones. The framing, I suppose, our constitutional and social context for Article 4 of the 1922 Constitution, which is uh, the primary aspect of that uh, text guaranteeing um, the Irish language a status within the document, uh, is a controversial one, and I suppose one which, as the Attorney General has alluded to there, uh, carries a certain legacy and has carried a certain legacy forward, not only to Article 8 of the current 1937 text, but also the way in which both documents uh, dealt with what exactly it meant to have a constitutionally first, but in practice, minority language as the language of the country. In that respect, I suppose the t context of the, the debate in 1922 about the inclusion of Irish is um, framed by reference to two primary drivers. The first being the contested and uncertain position of Irish speakers in existence and in practice. There is uh, a significant amount of debate and a significant amount of controversy over the proportion of speakers in the country who were monolingually or indeed actively bilingually speaking Irish at the time of drafting. And there was an associated concern with whether or not the language was as such a public or a private aspect of life and to what extent it should be guaranteed as a right or merely tolerated as an aspect 
of personal identity uh, not to be expressed or to be perhaps actively accommodated within public spheres. The second aspect of controversy, and is one which Cohn notes as leaking through the text of Article 4, is the association of Irish with a particularly nationalist agenda, um, an association which led uh, to a huge amount of controversy before the drafting of the, the constitution within Cunner Gaelga itself, and as a result within the group who had, as private individuals and subsequently as public figures and politicians, come to champion the cause of the Irish language. So it's within that context a degree of uncertainty about the extent to which Irish will survive as a language and indeed who and what is being protected in practice and also a desire to not overly politicise a language which is on the one hand being used as a justification uh, for some kind of national exceptionalism and uh, a distinction from the United Kingdom proper uh, while also seeking to ensure that in using the language in that way, it is not seen as a block perhaps to uh, future unification of the island or to uh, political relationships within it. That all being said, I think when we look at the text of uh, Article 4, uh, and in particular um, the legal interpretation which had been given to language rights previous to it, what is perhaps striking is how brave it is in some respects. The significant case which comes before the introduction of the 1922 Act. Uh, 1922 text, I beg your pardon, uh, McGillivreda and, and McLean is in some respects, uh, or McGillivreda and uh, McBride and McGovern, McGillivreda and McGovern, is in some respects um, indicative of what exactly the drafters are trying to face down in including Article 4. In that case, it's a dispute about the uh, inclusion of lettering on the side of a cart in the Irish text as opposed to in, in English and, and Latin characters. And we have perhaps the sine qua non justification for the exclusion of Irish from the legal and institutional sphere of the country from then Lord Chief Justice O'Brien, who said, the characters were not the characters of the language which the Crown and the legislature recognises as the language of the United Kingdom for all legal and official public purposes. Parliament conducts its debates in English, legislation legislates in English, the enacting body expresses itself and the enactment which contains the relevant provisions is expressed in English. English is the language of the Crown, of, as I have said, the legislature, both in debate and enactment of all the government, administrative and public departments, of the courts, the Supreme Court, the courts of summary jurisdiction where this offence is under consideration, and of the constabulary. So what we effectively have, and I think which is articulated quite well there, is not only um, a bare tolerance for Irish, but a deliberate exclusion of it from public and institutional spaces, and its effective status as uh, not only, I suppose, extrajudicial, but in some respects, non-legal as a language. In that respect, Article 4 is exceptional in providing a uh, high status to the language and official recognition, and in that respect, uh, bounds ahead in, in some aspects um, from, I suppose, our, our, our neighbours in Wales and Scotland, although Wales has subsequently overtaken us in terms of practical provision. Cohn has noted, and I think others uh, like McCarrig and O'Thuhill have tried to interpret what exactly Article 4 was supposed to mean in practice, whether it was intended to provide a justiciable basis for language rights, or instead was intended uh, merely as a symbolic elevation of a particular aspect of national identity which many of the framers themselves ha had come to and has, had offered uh, for many of the leaders in 1916 a gateway to understanding nationalism and the Irish cause. In that respect, uh, McCorhig is probably the most correct in identifying that what effectively Article 4 does is create a, a figule or half official status for Irish where it is recognised, but the provision for the language which is to be made and any rights which are to be afforded uh, is largely left to the legislature. And we can see that certainly in the Courts of Justice Act 1924, which makes provision in paper for the appointment of Irish-speaking judges in Irish-speaking areas to the extent that it is practicable, uh, but remains silent on how exactly an Irish-speaking judiciary more generally is to be developed. And I think that uh, is made the main legacy which the text of Article 4 and its successor, Article 8, which remains uh, largely loyal to the original 1922 wording, uh, has given us. An idea that the language is symbolically important and indeed the first and national language, but is equally a language which is not provided for in terms of substantive rights and which instead is to be provided for uh, by the legislature. 
perhaps, and I'll, I'll finish on this because I'm aware David is going to keep me very much to time, we can see, I suppose, in the small body of uh, consideration, judicial consideration, uh, which we have of Article 4, um, some of the, I suppose, issues which will continue to dog uh, the interpretation of Article 4 and now Article 8 uh, in terms of what exactly it means to have a first and national language, which is nevertheless a minority tongue. Uh, Aquilon and McCrotty and Attorney General and Joyce in these respects are two of the first cases seeking to grapple with Article 4, although both in effect uh, subjugate the consideration of language rights to considerations of natural and constitutional justice. That tendency to view language rights as more procedural than substantive uh, is one which continues to be evidenced in some judicial consideration uh, even now. The idea that language is effectively a procedural issue as opposed to a fundamentally human rights one, uh, is one we still continue to grapple with, due in part to the procedural considerations that go along with interpretation and translation in court, but I think more fundamentally as a result of a failure to exactly identify what in particular it means to have a right to a national language. Uh, O'Fowler and McLean is perhaps um, the most well-known case dealing with language rights uh, and certainly grappling with what Article 4 was attempting to do. In that case, um, a dispute between uh, Conor na Gaelga and the tenants of one of the buildings which they were the owner of resulted in the service of pleadings on the tenants in Irish. Uh, subsequently, there was a debate when the tenants failed to appear in court and Conor na Gaelga sought, um, uh, sought to, to dismiss the motion for, uh, in default of delivery for failure to deliver a defence. That petition was denied, or that motion rather, was denied by the High Court in part on the basis that the pleadings had been served only in Irish and not provided in translation. Uh, in the High Court, President O'Sullivan noted um, that no more than the Article 4 meant no more than this, that every person should be entitled in his option to use either language in transacting legal business and he shall not suffer any impediment by reason of, lang of the language he uses. The Supreme Court uh, largely agreed, and Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Kennedy uh, noted that everything uh, within the sphere of the action of the government should be done to ensure that Irish was accommodated, but that parties should not uh, suffer a detriment as a result of their choice of language. What's apparent, however, in, in O'Fowl and McLean is, I suppose, a, a more underlying or perhaps a, a latent view of uh, the language as accommodating. Uh, so the idea that the Irish speaker within the court is required to uh, accommodate the English speaker and vice versa, but without an acknowledgement uh, that Irish speakers, while entitled to use their language, necessarily suffer a greater uh, burden in complying with the majoritarian interest than the majority of speakers would in complying with a minority tongue. In, in that respect, and some of the logic in, in O'Fowl and McLean has carried over into more recent decisions. I think when we look at judgments like Nichalacon, uh, and uh, to a certain extent McCorrig, we see the idea that there cannot be representative juries uh, uh, extracted from an Irish-speaking population because the pool is too small. And equally, and perhaps more uh, ironically in Nikiali, the idea that Irish language plates no more uh, than Irish uh, plates on a cart uh, cannot be permissible under the existing legislation where no provision is made for them. In both of those cases, we see, I think, the themes and in perhaps the Attorney General's words, the legacies of Article 4 carrying over into the way we deal with Article 8. It is a text which provides a high symbolic value uh, to the Irish language, but in many, in many respects uh, delegates any provision for rights which would attach to that any substance to the legislature and sees it as not only uh, permissible, but perhaps uh, indeed acceptable. Uh, that in making that provision, the practical provision would be for English speakers and English text, and that any accommodation of Irish would be uh, to the extent that it is compatible with that. McCorrick has noted that as a result of that, we have in effect uh, a case in which Irish is the national tongue and accommodated only in as much as it can be tolerated by a majority English-speaking uh, public. It's tempting in that respect, I think, to read the text of Article 4 um, as a somewhat ambivalent uh, commitment to Irish, which has been uh, delayed successively as a result of the adoption of the same kind of interpretation. Um, 15 years after the entry into force of the 19 Constitution, de Valera justified the retention of similar words in Article 8 on the basis that Irish was the first and national language and the language most associated with the people and traditions of the country. English was, in contrast, the language of those who came as invaders. And yet, it is very much the language of the legislature and the language of policy which has been used to provide uh, for both languages within the island. 
It would be 77 years after de Valera's statements before we had concrete rights to do business with the state through Irish, and nearly a century before those were provided in a quite substantive manner, and in a manner which keeps pace with our neighbours in Wales. In many respects, then, the crucial components necessary for a bilingual state were present in Article 4, uh, but largely failed to be enacted and certainly were not provided in a substantive and coherent policy manner. The result of that is that, in many respects, uh, the great language shift, which is often attributed to the 18th and 19th centuries in Ireland, had its greatest uh, progress, and progress perhaps in a negative respect, in the early 20th century where there was a consistent neglect to engage with policy and legislative provisions which would protect and safeguard Irish language speakers and Irish language communities, and instead a delegation um, to the legislature of a task which it, it did not fulfil, and a, ref a repeated reference to Article 4 as a symbol of national identity while simultaneously neglecting what that would mean in practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roisin. You kept admirably to time there, so I'm very pleased with you. Uh, are you okay now, Rachel? Yeah. So, uh, Rachel, uh, once more with feeling, communitarian <laughs> conceptions of property in the drafting, oh, there it is, in the drafting of the 1922 Constitution. Thanks very much, uh, David, and to Donal and Laura for bringing us all together for this lovely occasion. Uh, I had to persevere with the slides because my aim is to inflict some direct quotes from the drafting of the Constitution in 1922 that I think shed light on really very different conceptions of property that were both debated within uh, the preparation of the 1922 Constitution and then and ultimately what we might term a no property constitution emerging from that process and draw some lessons from those insights as to how we might deal with a challenging relationship that we're grappling with under the 1937 Constitution, which is how should we relate constitutional property rights protections and democratic power? What should the balance uh, in terms of constitutional protection look like between these two ideas? And that's a relationship that has been fraught and um, inconsistent under the 1937 Constitution. So initially we had a phase wherein the common good and social justice were actually treated as fundamentally non-justiciable ideas. Uh, then through the 80s and the 90s we saw a resurgence of interest in a more absolutist idea of property. In particular the idea that the constitutional protection for property rights property rights formed a basis for a degree of judicial supervision as to how the legislature and the executive might distribute the costs of collective goods through legislative measures. Um, in more recent years, we've seen uh, uh, something of a stepping back from that more absolutist approach, a greater focus on procedural protections for property rights, and uh, in recent years, a resurgence of interest in Article 40.5 of the Constitution's protection for the dwelling. And I think now we're seeing the housing and environmental crises that we're grappling with today very much refocusing attention on how to strike an appropriate balance between constitutional property and democratic power. So I suppose my question for us today is what can we learn from 1922 as to where to go with this relationship under the 1937 constitution, if anything? Um, so, as the Attorney General alluded to, there were two, um, three drafts, two of which very much coalesced in 1922, drafts A and B on the topic of property, and a very different approach to property taken in draft C. Um, and I've given you the text there of draft B, uh, which, as you can see, strikes a very different tone on property rights uh, than we see in 1937, or indeed in the ultimately enacted 1922 constitution. The language, strikingly in Article 1 of the uh, Draft B, so leading out the constitutional document with an engagement with property rights issues, reflecting the centrality of land questions to national identity and national discourse in 1922, but an express and fundamental subordination of private property to the public right and public welfare, and a strong articulation of the idea of individual duties uh, set out in uh, Article 1 of Draft B. 
And uh, the committee noted that this was lifted almost directly from Patrick Pierce's essay, uh, The Sovereign People, and had a very direct connection to the democratic programme of Dáil Éireann in 1919. Uh, so this was a document that, uh, this was an article uh, in draft B that reflected not only the nationalistic endeavours that were culminating in that document, but also that social and economic agenda, that radical outlook on these issues that the Attorney General alluded to earlier. Interesting to reflect, I think, uh, as we'll see, this was not ultimately included in draft B uh, as it was ultimately adopted uh, in 1922, but interesting to query perhaps if public opinion in 1922 would have been uh, as accepting of this approach to property as the drafting committee itself was uh, in draft B. Um, Alan notes that by 1922, uh, about two thirds of tenants uh, had acquired their holdings at that stage. And Tom Garvin points out that that strong class of proprietors at the moment of independence in Ireland uh, was something of a bulwark against more radical social change occurring thereafter. Um, so uh, the Attorney General suggested that there was a nervousness around public consultation and public engagement in 1922. And I would just query whether this would have been in particular a provision that might have um, been... Uh, uh, a sensitive one uh, in that respect if public consultation had been engaged with. So draft C then took a, a very different approach uh, generally, but in particular on the issue of property. Um, and it's a draft that we can see having some uh, connections to 1937's ultimate treatment uh, of private property, particularly in Article 43 of the Constitution, and evidence that this draft was considered in that context. So um, draft C dealt with property in a number of provisions. Uh, Article 62 protected the right to hold private property, but expressly identified a legal basis for limiting uh, the extent of those rights. It again used duty language in a way that is strikingly absent from the property rights provisions in 1937. Um, strikingly singles out rights in respect of alienation, bequest, and inheritance. And that's an unusual feature of the 1937's protection for private ownership as well, in that uh, Article 43 singles out alienation, bequest, and inheritance as key incidence powers of ownership. That's a very unusual approach in comparative terms when we look at constitutional property clauses internationally. And draft C in 1922 seems to be the first source of that uh, singling out of alienation, bequest, and inheritance. Uh, again, there we see a very, uh, a very frank acknowledgement of the limits of private ownership. The fiscal claims of the state uh, and other purposes are acknowledged as a basis for limiting uh, those rights. And that really reflects uh, an important point, which is that in 1922, public intervention in property issues was widely socially and politically accepted. At that stage, we had seen um, the preliminary unravelling of the feudal structure. We had seen extensive work on the part of the Land Commission in, in redistributing land in Ireland. So at the inception of our constitutional order in 1922, there was always already a very clear acceptance that private ownership could not be and ought not to be absolute, and that the state had an important role to play in structuring and regulating issues in relation to landholding and property uh, ownership more generally. Finally then in draft C, interesting to note, an express treatment of the question of expropriation. So an express guarantee that if the state acquires your property, it must be for community benefit and with compensation. Again, notable that in the 1937 constitution, no express guarantee of any right to compensation for expropriation, although one has been read into the property rights clauses uh, in a number of judicial decisions. Article 64 then in draft C also dealt with property issues, again signalling an important role for the state in structuring and uh, managing property issues in respect of land. Interesting, given current debates, um, a goal of ensuring every citizen a healthy residence uh, in the context of housing and shelter. Um, again, duties on the part of property rights holders in terms of efficient working and use of the land. 
And finally there, I've highlighted um, the idea of the unearned increment being uh, something that uh, rebounds to redounds to the state rather than to the individual. So draft C suggested that any increase in the value of land that arises without the expenditure of labor capital shall accrue to the community. Um, and that was an important internal debate within the drafting process. Uh, there was a, a degree of disagreement as to how far to go in terms of the unearned increment. CJ France articulated the rationale for this provision very clearly when he suggested, as you can see there, that um, some of our most problematic inequalities in relation to wealth uh, arise from the fact that the purchase of land can result in the significant increase in value of that land and that value being captured by one or a small group of individuals. So he was strong in urging the need for a express, an express constitutional provision that would guarantee no individual claim over the unearned increment. And this has really been a problem that has um, bedeviled the 1937 constitution and legislative attempts to adapt to changing property markets, notwithstanding the constitutional protection for property rights. And I think we see this most clearly in the Supreme Court's decision in Re-Article 26 and the Planning and Development Bill uh, 1999, where this question of how do we justify and rationalize a clawing back by the state of this unearned increment within a framework uh, wherein the constitutional structure doesn't expressly provide that the unearned increment accrues to the state, not the individual. And that's a problem we continue to grapple with today. So we're looking at taxing residentially zoned land uh, now in Ireland. And when you look at the legislative scheme for that, very extensive lead-ins required in order to manage the fact that um, there is no clarity really under the 1937 constitution as to who earns the unearned increment and how how much action the state can take in terms of clawing back that unearned increment. So an interesting feature of the 1922 debates that that was so front and centre in their discussions uh, and uh, very much uh, in the background in 1937. The second internal debate of note is in relation to compensation for expropriation. As I mentioned, the 1937 constitution doesn't uh, expressly guarantee any right to compensation. And there was extensive debate within the 1922 committee as to whether compensation should be expressly guaranteed or not. As you can see, there are concerns from some of the committee that um, an express guarantee for compensation would be too much of a, uh, an impediment in terms of legislative freedom and ought not to be attempted. Uh, and that indeed is what occurs in 1922 and carries through to 1937, that the uh, Constitution does not lock us into providing compensation at all or at any particular value in circumstances where uh, property is expropriated for public purposes. So what happened then with these drafts and these internal debates? Well, as the Attorney General noted, draft B was ultimately selected in 1922. Uh, there was significant discomfort on the part of the British government with Article 1. Uh, that stemmed from the claims as regards sovereignty in Article 1, but uh, the uh, drafting material illustrates also from, as, the, as was termed uh, in the discourse with the British government, the communistic overtones of Article 1. Uh, and so uh, Hugh Kennedy essentially traded off that language in Article 1 um, uh, in the drafting process. And what we ended up with was a 1922 constitution that provided no protection for private property rights at all and made minimal provision in relation to state property over natural resources in Article 11. So the solution in 1922, somewhat strikingly given our current debates around housing, for example, was that property rights protection was left entirely up to the democratic process and existing private law protections for private ownership. Uh, and what emerged was fundamentally a no property constitution. So in terms of future directions and, and how we uh, adapt to new challenges around housing and environmental protection, for example, under the 1937 constitution, what might we learn from these discussions or what's striking in terms of these discussions in 1922? 
Well, we have on the one hand the, the more extreme approach of outright subordination of private property rights to the common good in draft B. Um, we have the express clawback of unearned increment in draft C. The express provision for compensation in draft C as well. Um, throughout both drafts, a striking recognition that private ownership brings with it duties to the common good, as well as individual powers and individual claims. But I think perhaps most fundamental in terms of takeaways from this uh, experience in 1922 is that there was a very clear consensus across the divisions within the drafting committee that the scope of property rights should be determined on a communitarian basis, albeit with different views emerging in the drafting process as to how that should be best framed in constitutional terms. As I've mentioned, the solution in 1922 was to provide ultimately that the democratic process would be the forum within which these debates around the balance between the individual and the collective in respect of property would be struck. 1937 took a different approach to that, and I think we're still grappling with the implications of that change in approach in 1937 for this question of how best to relate democratic power and constitutional property rights on, uh, on the other hand. Um, so um, with thanks for your patience in relation to getting those quotes uh, before you, uh, I'll uh, leave it there and look forward to the discussion in panel later. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, and congratulations on coping with the uh, sudden onslaught of the air conditioning as well. Our final speaker in this session, Jamie McLaughlin, is going to talk about environmental stewardship and Article 11 of the 1922 Constitution. Uh, thank you very much, David. I just get the uh, stopwatch on here so I don't go over time. Uh, good, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much to the organisers for the opportunity to, to speak here today. It's a real honour. Um, so, as you can see, my presentation concerns Article 11 of the 1922 Constitution, um, which effectively deals with state property and the administration of that property, um, including natural resources in particular. Now, it is my argument that a state duty of environmental stewardship can be derived from the ingredients in this article, and importantly also from Article 10 in the 1937 Constitution, the success or provision to Article 11. Um, and th that's important because some of the case law which actually considers Article 11 in most detail occurs in the context of case law in Article 10 with the judges looking back to Article 11 for some guidance as to the meaning of, of Article 10. So you might wonder why looking at this topic in particular. And the answer is really that you know, the Irish state, as we know, was born in circumstances of great adversity in 1922. Uh, and again, today we're faced with adverse circumstances in, in the forms of very serious climate, ecological and environmental crises. And so I was curious as to whether the 1922 constitution might be read as having anything to say say about these current crises um, that we are um, facing. So to go straight to Article 11, so what does it say? So this is in its final version, it is heavily watered down compared to, as uh, Rachel noted, earlier versions um, concerning, you know, which had provided for, in effect, the unfettered public ownership of natural resources and land with no protection at all for private property. Um, as we can see here, uh, so land and natural resources vested in the state, but there is some mention of subject to existing trusts, grants, le leases, uh, 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 and so on. Um, now, importantly, I think the subject matter here, you can see very much concerning elements of the natural environment, land, waters, air, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And importantly, for, for my argument as, um, as well, uh, the requirement that the administration of natural resources in state property must be carried out uh, by legislation. Um, and there's an interesting provision as well at the end that the, the prohibiting the outright alienation of state property in this regard, and that if it is to be granted by way of lease or license, it must be under the control of the Oireachtas and um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the public interest. Um, now, as I mentioned, it's also necessary to look to um, Article 10, um, and now you can see some common features with Article 11, and indeed in the Barlow case, which I'm going to look at in a minute, Mr. Justice O'Donnell um, <clears throat> described Article 10 as, in effect, a recasting of Article 11. It, it, carry the same, it may have changed in, in shape or form, but not in substance really. So again, we have the mention of all natural resources, land, mines, minerals, water, uh, vesting in the state subject to existing interests. And again, the, importantly, the provision for the management of, of property and natural resources where it is carried out, that it be carried out um, by law. Now, um,
but again, the, the notion of natural resources, you'll notice, kind of left undefined. There's some suggestion about air and, and possibly the sources of energy, but largely left undefined um, as a kind of an important concept. Now, so the main case I want to look at today is, is that of Barlow. So um, now, Barlow is a very interesting case. I mean, it has everything in it from zoology to foreign policy and Magna Carta. So I, I'd encourage anyone to have a look at it. It is a fascinating case, really, despite the odd subject matter of uh, muscles, as you can see pictured there. So really, I suppose the case centred around um, a practice of Northern Irish registered fishing vessels um, harvesting mussel seed from Irish territorial waters. And so the issue to be resolved in the case really was, well, was this mussel seed, was this a natural resource, and was um, the, 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 the granting of permission by the state to these foreign vessels to come and fish in Irish waters, did that constitute the management of natural resources, and therefore did it have to be provided for by law, and what did it mean to provide it for by law? Now, interestingly, um, Justice O'Donnell was of the view that, yes, mussel seed was a natural resource, um, and he said, just from the plain meaning of the article, and noting also that the striking breadth of the language used, the repeated reference to all, all resources, etc., and also the Irish language phrase for all natural resources, gach all vermuin and odorha, literally every natural source of wealth. Um, now, so having decided that mussels were uh, a natural resource and that the uh, the, the granting of permission, which in this case had occurred by the executive, they'd entered into what was termed a voisinage agreement with Northern Irish authorities, and um, so the executive effectively gave permission for this practice. Um, so having determined that they were a natural resource, the issue then became, well, um, has the executive, in doing what it's done, has it done so by law? Has it managed natural resources by law? Um, and it, on this point, I think this is where an, I think an important principle can be derived here. So, just as O'Donnell is of the view that the reference to bylaw here, it means legislation. It means a primary legislation, an act of the Oireachtas. And, and importantly, he says so because of the accountability that is involved, decisions being made in public directly by the representatives of the people. So, and from this principle of the democratically accountable management of natural resources, um, I think we can, we, we can derive the beginnings of what I'm, what I'm saying is state stewardship. And the reason I say that is because, so we'll ask why is this democratic, uh, uh, or this provision for democratic accountability in the management of natural resources there? I suggest it's there because um, it allows the people to ensure that the state is managing resources then on, on their behalf or, or, or in their interests, uh, if you like. That's, that, that's the kind of function it can serve, and that's why it's important that these decisions are made directly by the people uh, in public so that those affected by them can know about it and kind of cast judgment and decide whether the state is actually doing this in their interests or on their behalf. And if you accept that idea then that the state ultimately is managing these things on behalf of uh, the people and in, and in their interests, um, I suggest that implies a duty that the state has to do so responsibly, or it has to take care of natural resources. Um, and, and, and that's where um, then the notion of stewardship can come in. You can see from across some of the, some of the definitions of the concept I've, I've picked out here. So stewardship is a, it's cross, seen across many religions and, and secular ethics and philosophy, but it particular has been implied in the context of environmental law. And you can see there, it really connotes the kind of the idea of having a duty to care for something on behalf of or for the benefit of another, and that, and that something is usually something valuable, so I mean, like natural resources, um, if you like. Um, now, uh, Barrett, in particular, um, has an interesting way, I think, of conceptualizing stewardship, which I think is useful to um, apply to Article 11 and, and Article 10. Um, so she asks it's the what, the who, the for whom, and the for what. I think this is an interesting way of looking at Article 11. So the what, clearly, again, the subject matter of it being you know, land, water, air, uh, you know, elements of the natural environment. And, it, and I think that that, that that concept of natural resources is, is, is open enough to potentially go further than that. We saw it, it includes mussel seed from Barlow, but I think it could be pushed further, perhaps, and, and you know, bringing it back to what I said at the start and the kind of environmental and climate crises we're facing at the moment, might uh, the idea of a stable climate be regarded as a natural resource? Or indeed, healthy, functioning, biodiverse ecosystems and the, and the biodiversity services, or the, eco the ecosystem services that they provide, whether it be you know, through the, the purification of air and water, the, um, the, the fertilization of vegetation, etc., which is necessary for our food production processes. Um, and and you know, thinking back to that phrase in the Irish language, all natural resources, gok, um, 
<clears throat> every natural source of wealth, the ecosystem services that which it was human society depends on to function really is a, a natural source of wealth. So it's interesting to think about the potential scope of that idea of natural resources and whether it might include a stable climate and uh, functioning ecosystems and what that might entail for the state's responsibilities. Now, the who, in terms of who the duty bearer is, um, obviously the state or the Oireachtas uh, being, being identified and the requirement, as Justice O'Donnell says in Barlow, for the management to be carried out by law or pursuant to law, so it's, it's just the Oireachtas. And now, for whom as well, and in whose benefit, I think, um, presents some interesting questions. So, Justice O'Donnell in, in Barlow repeatedly makes reference to the people. And so, I suppose, uh, it's, it's, you know, I'm sure popular sovereignty has been touched on already today and will be touched on again later. Um, but so I think that this idea that the state ultimately is managing natural resources on behalf of, for the benefit of the, the people, is quite consonant with the notion of popular sovereignty, which has been described as a leitmotif running through both the 1922 and 1937 constitutions. Now, but I wonder as well, might, you know, um, could we consider it possibly um, that the state might also have a duty to nature itself or to non-humans? That's, I think, a bit more difficult to try and derive that from either the 1922 or 1937 constitution, given their anthropocentric focus. Um, however, and that may require express amendment, something which the um, Citizens' Assembly on Biodiversity Loss is looking at at present, I believe. Um, now, the issue of future generations, though, might the, the concept of the sovereign people possibly include future generations, given the kind of the significance of how we manage natural resources today for uh, the livability of the planet uh, in future and what the state's role might be um, in that regard. Now, then, finally, the for what? And this is, I think, where Article 11 and Article 10 are most silent. What values are being promoted by the, the stewardship or the management of natural resources? And here, I think, um, so you, you can possibly look at it, I suggest, from an economic perspective, the state property, and should it just be about exploitation and the generation of wealth? Or can you look at it from a more ecological perspective and recognize that land and natural resources and the, the, the interconnectedness and the dependence of human society uh, and, and human survival, indeed, on uh, land and, and, and natural resources and, and how we use them? Now, it, if you want to take kind of, I suppose, maybe um, an originalist approach or a framer's intent approach, and you go back and look um, at the drafting, Article 11, and, and, and the, uh, having a provision like Article 11, the, the, the framers and drafters, I think, were of the view that it was important that, we that natural resources should be uh, in, in public ownership because they felt it would help secure the independent economic development of the state. So you could say from maybe an originalist perspective that the, the kind of the value this should promote is economic development. But I would suggest you could also perhaps take a more dynamic and evaluative understanding or interpretation to it and, as I say, apply it to the, our current context and the crises we face and maybe consider it from an ecological perspective. Look looking at property through an ecological, not just an economic lens. But even if we were to look at it um, just at a purely economic lens, I would suggest that, that, that it can still entail more than just exploitation, because as I've outlined, ecosystem services are, are a source of natural wealth for us, that we depend on, the, we depend on them. Um, and, and that therefore, that even from a purely economic perspective and given our dependence on them, that, that the preservation, the protection, the conservation and the restoration of nature and the environment and not just its exploitation could be construed as um, responsible uh, management of natural resources. Now, I include this image somewhat in jest, but kind of to, to trigger, I suppose, a deeper reflection on what exactly, you know, responsible management of natural resources might look like and what that kind of entails for the state. There's a lot of evidence in the ecological science literature that trophic rewilding and the in reintroduction of apex predators can do enormous good to restoring balance to damaged ecosystems. So, I should also, I suppose, suggest at this point that the kind of the duty of environmental stewardship I'm proposing um, would be more akin to a directive principle um, than, than justiciable, and that beyond policing compliance with the requirement that management be carried out by law, uh, as happened in Barlow, I suggest that the courts would probably, given the emphasis on direct democratic accountability in Barlow, that the courts would see it um, as, as being more akin to a directive principle, and that the question of whether the state has actually engaged in responsible management uh, would be a non-justiciable issue, and it's primarily something for the legislators uh, to, to, to consider. And so I'll close then, if I might, uh, with a quote from uh, Justice William Brennan, formerly of the US Supreme Court, which I think is apt. And he says, the genius of the Constitution rests not in any static meaning it might have had in a world that is dead and gone, but in the adaptability of its great principles to cope with current problems and current needs. And I suggest, although he was speaking in the context of the US Constitution, that is very much applicable to uh, the principle I've argued is, is present in Article 11, um, the idea of environmental stewardship and its 
and I think it's testament to the quality then of the 1922 Constitution that it can still speak, as he says, to present problems and, and current needs, and, and perhaps even more significantly, as I've also tried to outline, I, I would argue that the principle of environmental stewardship has been carried on in Article 10, given their similarity, and that that is something that our legislators need to consider uh, um, more seriously, given the gravity of the crises, ecological, environmental, uh, and climate that we face, and they need to think about what it requires um, and implement what it demands. So I think I've gone slightly over time, so I will finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamie. And we've had three very thought-provoking and really interesting uh, contributions. Not particularly linked, so it's going to be difficult to uh, uh, come up with a, uh, a, a way of attacking it. We do have a microphone if anybody has, has questions, so please uh, do raise your hand if you have a question. We're just going to kick it off, because I've, I've got the mic now. Um, Rachel, the, the Common and Rail, the first government of, of the Irish Free State, everybody refers to it. They, you, you can't refer to it without using the word conservative. Mm. Uh, that's always the word that's used. And the idea of Hugh Kennedy trotting over to London with a, mm -hmm. a draft constitution which is regarded as communistic, just, it, it beggars belief. It's, it's really extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's a really fascinating missed chapter in the history of, of property in Ireland that we did have a serious socialist moment wherein the path that we, had, we took in relation to property could have been very different. Instead, we had a, a vacuum, if you like, created with the constitution that didn't deal with property at all. Into that vacuum could have come socialist ideas through the political process, but in fact, exactly as you suggest, through the 1920s, the predominant political parties took a very conservative approach, and that then was the way in which property began to be amplified, and I think that snowballed consistently right up to 1937, when we see um, you know, a much more, uh, I suppose, balanced approach in the sense of trying to protect private ownership within a broader social and economic framework um, that had... Uh, social justice dimensions to it, undoubtedly, um, but uh, made a much more robust attempt to protect private ownership um, that's very stark when set alongside the draft Article 1 in, in, in Draft B. Absolutely. But still subject to the public good. Absolutely, absolutely, and um, everyone in the room, uh, a lot of people in the room were sick of me <laughs> telling them how important the public good dimension uh, to the 1937 Constitution is, and I think that's why when we look at the 1922 process, um, that draft C was actually quite influential in the formulation of the 1937 provisions, which uh, took a similar structure of protecting private ownership robustly at an institutional level, but recognising individual rights that were clearly delimited by social justice principles, and attempting to amplify in some detail what those social justice principles would look like. Roisin, I mean, one of the striking things about the 1937 Constitution is just how much of it actually derives from, from the 1922 document. So even though, uh, as the Attorney General was, was mentioning, the 1922 Constitution was only enforced for 15 years, much of it was, was reincorporated by de Valera into the, into, the next, um, into the next iteration. The question of the Irish language is interesting because, as you, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's only mentioned in passing in, in 1922. De Valera makes a huge big deal about it. And, he, you know, he, he says it's, it's the first official language and all the rest of it. But in terms of actual practical rights and support and anything that's justiciable, is there really much change? Absolutely, and I think, I mean, if we're reading the, the 22 text, we have the kind of symbolic references in, in Article 4, where we then have a, a passing reference to the need for legislation to be in action in both languages in 42. Uh, and unfortunately, that has no practical effect, because of course, the Governor General doesn't speak Irish, <laughs> and very sensibly refuses to sign a document he can't read and verify its content. So it's, it's only ever passed subsequently, um, in some cases, in a kind of a scattering of cases, subsequently translated. And we're dealing with the legacy of that kind of disjunct between translation and what is promised on the page and what is actually available in both languages still. So we have Mr Justice Hogan's judgment from the Supreme Court just a few weeks ago just emphasising how far behind we are in terms of providing a full complement of legislation. Um, but I think what's, what's really interesting, and certainly when it's put in contrast with kind of uh, Jamie and Rachel's, is just how little detail we're provided in terms of any limits 
of justiciability or not in, term, in terms of the language. To some extent, de Valera's emphasis in, in 1937 on retaining it is probably driven to a large extent by the work of the Commission of Gaelic, though, which comes about four years after, three to four years after uh, the, the 22 constitution. It illustrates just how quickly the language is being lost uh, and, and just how much really is needed to, to be done both in in legal terms, but also in very concrete policy terms to support the communities that are, that are still speaking Irish at all. So to some extent, it's a, it's a retrospective panic when it's retained in 1937, uh, but we still don't get the policy match up and we still don't get the legislature stepping forward, which is really the source of concern. And you mentioned the fact that uh, Tim Healy wouldn't sign docu- uh, laws, laws in Irish, which I, I suppose there's a certain um, ar- argument for. The other thing about the 1937 constitution is, is that the Irish language version of it is, is the main version the thing was drafted in English, then translated into Irish, and that is, is, is the version that, in law, uh, takes precedence. Absolutely, and I think Jamie's making the point there that we have to return to the Irish language text to get a more holistic meaning sometimes. Um, I mean, the primary problem with that is that it's, you know, we love to see it in some respects. Um, but, of course, it, it's driven by this sort of, um, I suppose, psychological disjunct where we elevate the language in theory while understanding that it's, it is a minority tongue in practice and simultaneously taking no real active steps in order to change that in the future. So there is, um, and I mean, we're still dealing with the, the Attorney General is talking about legacies this morning. The legacy of that is still that we're continuing to have a text which uh, a majority of people in the country can't understand and it's an original and most binding form, um, but we're not seeking to, to actively remedy that through educating people so they can uh, Jamie, that, that was really fascinating. The, the, uh, again, there, there, there's, there's a certain amount of continuity between 1922 and 1937 in, in terms of, of, um, of stewardship. So th- is, is the article more or less intact? It's, it's, re, it's, it's rephrased slightly, but... The, the yeah, so there is, um, there is some concern expressed by the Department of Finance, actually, um, when, when it comes to the drafting of the 1937 Constitution. A number of civil servants had raised concerns about Article 11, and they were particularly worried by the fact that it prevented the state from outright alienating property, that they thought that should be opened up and the state should be able to do this. They were also, they expressed concerns um, that as well, that it, that it was the Oireachtas, as it were, the legislature had had to provide for management. There was some suggestion that maybe the resources or the control or the administration of resources should be vested directly in the executive. So, I mean, that's kind of what was issue, at issue in Barlow, that, that the, the executive had unilaterally, without any kind of parliamentary authorization, had given permission to foreign ships, Northern Ireland registered, albeit, to come into Irish waters. And so what Justice O'Donnell was very keen to stress was that, that the kind of continuity, that the underlying rationale of 11 and 10 is the public accountability aspect of this. And I think that fits well into the overall idea of popular sovereignty that runs through both documents. And in terms of the, you mentioned the Citizens' Assembly uh, recommendation about uh, a constitutional amendment on, on protecting biodiversity and, and avoiding biodiversity law, loss. From what you're saying, I mean, is, is, would there be another route that you wouldn't need an amendment that you could actually use Article 10 to, to do that? Um, to be honest, I think, um, like, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent the courts at present would be prepared to, to buy my argument, if you like, that, that, that I've made. Um, I would have very my, persuasive. I would have my doubts. Um, I, I, who knows? We never know what the Supreme Court will do. Um, but um, I think, it, in one sense, the argument I propose is slightly problematic because Article 10 and 11 fundamentally are you know, they're written in terms of property. So even if you were to reconceptualize property in terms of ecology and not just economy, um, I, I from the point of view of something like the rights of nature, it may be better to have a new provision which is clearer. And, and you know, the idea of the rights of nature, of course, is that it moves beyond the kind of capitalist idea of nature as a, as a kind of a something we can plunder, um, and that, that nature has value in its own right. It has rights to thrive and to flourish. And it may be best to put something new in there to kind of fully reflect a, a break or a new beginning, redefining our relationship with nature, which I think we need to do given the gravity of the, of the crises we face. And that comes back to your, what you were saying about property rights. There's duties as well. Absolutely, and uh, it's striking that the 1937 Constitution didn't include any duty language in respect of property. There are some other uh, small pockets of it, but um, it's absent in the property context in 1937. Okay, uh, there I'm afraid we have to leave it to Roisin, to Rachel, to Jamie. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you for your attention, and the good news is you're now getting a reward with some coffee. (laughs) 